continue uh, actually something that I shared several weeks ago <clears throat> about uh, David, how he found out about this desire in the heart of God to have a habitation. We know that in the New Testament, we're the fulfillment of that. We are the habitation of God, or we at least supposed to be, a place where he lives his life, where Christ is at home, where Christ is more preeminent in his home than we are. And <clears throat> David saw this, that God, that, that the Lord wanted a house. And uh, in that first uh, sharing on this particular area, <clears throat> of talking about how he came to that. We discovered that he found it in the woods and he found it <clears throat> uh, in his home in Bethlehem. He found it by experience through those two things. The scriptures declared that, but we also found out that he, he got it by um, what I called recent history because this whole thing that happened with losing the ark and everything probably happened in his lifetime. So that's why, you know, we look at it as scripture. You know, what happened with Eli and the losing of the ark and everything. But it was, it was probably in his lifetime. So that was actually recent history for him. And that's why I never did explain that. But that's why I put that under that category. <clears throat> the last category I want to share is that he, David also knew or found this thing out about the Lord wanting a habitation from the scripture. And of course, he only had the Old Testament scripture, and even that he only had up to <coughs> a certain juncture, uh, not even as far as Ezra and Nehemiah and all that. That came much later. <coughs> so primarily the Pentateuch. And may I say primarily the writings of Moses to make that more specific. Um, so uh, in First Chronicles chapter 28, <coughs> Let's um, read verse 1 and 2. And David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, and the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course, and the captains over thousands, the captains over hundreds, and the stewards over all the substance and possession of the king and of his sons, with the officers and with the mighty men and with all the valiant men unto Jerusalem. Then David, the king, stood upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren, and my people. As for me, I had in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God and had made ready for the building. And I want you to specifically notice I had in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord. <clears throat> As we know, the presence of the Lord rested there on that ark. Let's go to the next chapter. We'll just read a couple of verses in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. <clears throat> Verse 1. Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon, my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great. For the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. <clears throat> and this is a clear declaring forth that David didn't build a religious edifice. That David wasn't trying to be religious in building a house for God. <clears throat> that in his mind, you have to conceive this, that in his mind, thank you, Brian. In his mind, God, he saw that God wanted a habitation. He saw that God, he saw this in the heart of God. Now, how can, how can I stand up here and explain that? How can my words even come close to an explanation of literally what David saw in the heart of God when he saw of all the things that he did with his people and all of the work that he was doing, he just literally wanted to live in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He wanted to live not in there somewhere, 
but as the life that lived in the home, us, his house. So, you know, in one sense, I'm a fool to even attempt to express this, but thank God for the Holy Spirit who can say beyond anything that I could try to express with human words. And so he states this, um, this thing, uh, <clears throat> that, that for the palace is not for man, but for God. And let me just point out the difference. In David's heart and what he was building and what he wanted for God is not like a church building. It's not like a building with a steeple, which is a house for us. We call it a house for God. When does, you know, <laughs> you know. Do you, think, do you think Jesus is living in those empty churches on Monday? <laughs> or Tuesday? I mean, do you think he's hanging out in there? Do you think he lives in there? No, that's not the church. We're the church. Well, do you think he's living in us? Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that by watching us. <clears throat> you would actually think we're living in us. Amen? So let's drop on down to verse uh, 3. Moreover, because I have set my affection... Notice he always talks about his heart, now specifically his affection. Because I have set my affection upon the house of my God, his, he already had a heart after God. That's clear, right? I mean, that's the one guy in all the Bible that says he had a heart after God. But now, because he loves God so much, he has seen <clears throat> that God wants a house, a habitation, a dwelling place. And now he set his affection on the house of his God. For himself? No. For God alone. Moreover, because I have set my affection upon the house of my God, I have of mine own proper goods of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God. Notice again, a repeat. Over and above all that I have prepared, for the holy house. In that one verse, he, he, he refers to the house of God three times. His work is not to build God. God exists. God is, is sufficient. He doesn't need to run to God's rescue. He doesn't need to stand up for God. But he has seen that God wants a habitation and he can do something about that. And he set his heart, because he set his heart on the Lord, then he has set his heart that the Lord would have a habitation, not just a people. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? And then finally, in Psalms, if you'll turn there with me, Psalm 132, which I will, I will be frank with you, is, this, is the place that God showed me David's heart. Um, and moved me. David's whole life was surrounding, you know, I say his whole life, his early part was in preparation. But once he became king, he became king to use his power. I mean, you know, God, why, why won't God make you king or this, that, or do this or whatever? When David became king, he already knew that he was a man after his own heart. When David became king, when God made David king, he did it knowing Hallelujah, that David was going to spend the rest of his kingship from start to finish, from bringing the ark back to David's tabernacle, which was a habitation, to building the temple and through Solomon. He started his kingship bringing back the ark. He died with Solomon building that temple and, and dedicating it. He was an old man by then. But he spent his life... And therefore, all, all enemies that came against him came against the man who was going to do everything he can to have a habitation of God. 
So he begins, Psalm 132, Lord, remember David and all of his afflictions. All, you know, all the trouble, no, 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 not just all the trouble, you know, the time I stumped my tongue. No, these are the afflictions of a man who has given himself to do what no one else will do. And you know what? There's an enemy that will fight that kind of bringing forth. You know, let's just let people gather in a building called that church and, and the Lord have no habitation in the earth. We say He lives in us, but he, He's in us. We live in us. And so He goes on to say in verse 2, How He swore unto the Lord and vowed unto the mighty God of Jacob. Surely I will not come into the tabernacle of my house, nor go up into my bed. I will not give sleep to mine eyes or slumber to mine eyelids until I find out a place for the Lord and habitation for the mighty God of Jacob. Lo, we heard of it in Ephrathah, and we found it in the fields of the wood. We will go... Let's see, let's drop down to verse 8. Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. And let's go to verse 13. For the Lord hath chosen Zion. He hath desired it for his habitation. <clears throat> this is my rest forever. Here will I dwell. For I have desired it. <clears throat> and so... David is declaring throughout this, this realization that hit him. And he swore, he swore to the Lord, I can't fix everything, Lord, but I will not rest until you find rest. <clears throat> and so, we find that by reading the scriptures, by reading Moses, <clears throat> that David, he discovered that it was the ark that moved the camp in the wilderness and not just the cloud. He found that the ark went before them. And just to show you that, look with me, and we'll be going through a bunch of scriptures temporarily, but Numbers chapter uh, 10. <clears throat> Numbers 10 and verse uh, 33. Numbers 10, beginning with verse 33. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. Now, <coughs> when I finish this, when I get finished laying the foundation in Scripture, I'm going to show you in the New Testament that this is speaking of a habitation of God. Uh, verse 34, And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day, and they went out of the camp. And it came to pass when the ark set forward, when the ark set forward, that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Since I had you turn away from there, I'm just going to read it for you. That verse, and when it rested, talking about the ark, <clears throat> he, this is Moses. Moses said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. Uh, uh, sorry, verse 35. Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto thy many thousands of Israel. This is what David got out of that scripture. I'm going to re just read the scripture for you. It's Psalm 132, verse 8. You don't have to turn there. 
Arise, O Lord, into thy rest, thou and the ark of thy strength. This was not some sort of random quote by David. <clears throat> this is totally in line with bringing forth this habitation. This is in Psalm 132 where we just read it. It is a further or a clarifying explanation of what Moses was seeing. And David began to see in the scriptures, he began to see this reality that the Lord wanted a habitation and that the ark was going before and <clears throat> um, uh, uh, he, was, he, he saw, it's like you and I, when you see something in the scriptures, you don't just see what was written, do you? You see the Lord. You see, you see beyond it. You, you, begin to, you begin to have a communication with God Almighty. Instead of just reading ink on white paper, you can pick up any book and read ink on white paper. But, there, but with David, the same thing began to happen. He began to hear from Moses and through Moses, this ark is leading the way, as it says here in Numbers. This ark, who was written by Moses. This ark is leading the way. This ark is going somewhere. This ark is, is in front of everybody else. And it's, as it were, dragging the people of God along. Yes. Somewhere. <clears throat> and we we know from David's writing there in Psalm 30, 132 when he wrote that <clears throat> that that place that he's going was going forward. He's going to find rest and then and find that habitation that is prepared for him. <clears throat> and that's what what the psalm is about. Let's look in um, Deuteronomy chapter one. And again, David saw deep into these writings where we might just see regular things. Psalm, or, or Deuteronomy 1, verse 33. Who went in the way before you, speaking of the Lord, to search you out a place to pitch your tents, in fire by night to show you by the way that you should go, and in cloud by day. And here he is <clears throat> declaring clearly, when I say clearly, it is not as clear yet because the New Testament is going to take many of these things, which we are New Testament believers, and it's going to give us the true heart of it, just like David did, who's, who is quoted in the New Testament because he is a man who saw what was in the heart of God. <clears throat> and so, as this scripture says, the Lord, the ark, went before them and prepared the way. And anytime you, anytime you read that in the, in the Old Testament, in the Psalms or anywhere, God went before his people, well, what we see is some sort of invisible God going before him, going, you know, like God is this, you know, jolly green giant walking in front of Israel going before the way and defeating everybody. I'm sorry, that's not, that is a wrong picture. Their God was there on the Ark of the Covenant. That's where he rested. That was the God that went before him. That's why the Ark was put up front. <clears throat> and so, when that Ark moved, the people followed. But they didn't know, you know, I mean, it, as I said, it led the way to a, to a permanent habitation. But here, God is in their midst. God is in the midst of Israel. And, you know, you know, they don't fully understand it. They just say, well, God's with us. Kind of like Christianity. Well, God's with us. God's with us. He was with them. He was in the midst of the camp. He was going before them in the ark. But he was constantly trying to lead them into a certain reality of his heart. Do, do you understand that? That the ark wasn't just with them. I'm just with you. I just, you know what? I just wanted to hang out. You know. No, he set up a tabernacle in the midst of them. But that was a, not a permanent structure. That was not a permanent place in the earth. The tabernacle, what we're never called the tabernacle of God. We're called the temple of God. Amen? 
you know, because that thing was not meant to be the, the final resting place. So he's leading them into a permanent habitation. They don't know. God's just with me. You know, praise God. I accepted Jesus. God's with me. We're just like Israel who don't fully comprehend this. Now look with me in Exodus 15. Turn, please, to Exodus 15. And uh, verse 13. <clears throat> Exodus 15, 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people, that's the Ark of the Covenant, whom thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Folks, it doesn't get any plainer than that. This is the Ark of the Covenant leading them forth. Thou in thy mercy hath led thy people whom thou hast redeemed. What does that mean? Well, I mean, that's the redeemed. He's leading to, his, to a place where we are a holy habitation. God is dealing with the redeemed. It wasn't just about getting them out of Egypt. It wasn't just to redeem them from Egypt. He's still leading them. We say he's leading us to a place of rest. He's leading us to a place. Well, it's true until you find out in Hebrews what that rest is. And we'll, Lord willing, get into that. He's not just leading us into our marriages and our jobs and into what kind of car we should get and all this kind of stuff, folks. He's leading the redeemed into the the true fulfillment and whatever they did was a shadow. We're the real deal, but we're just as ignorant as, as Israel. Of what? Of the eternal plan of God? Forget that. David didn't find the eternal plan of God. He found the heart of God. He found what God really wanted instead of wandering around. <clears throat> and so, and this scripture says he used all of his strength to lead them forth unto, you know, to lead the redeemed unto his habitation. And to his place. Because we're supposed to end up being that place. Many of Israel never saw that God was pressing forward in this ark. He's moving forward. He's going forward. They'll stop. They'll rest. But then he'll start. He'll he'll start moving forward again. And up the camps. You know. Let's, you know. Why are we packing up? Why is he moving? Why is God doing this? You ever said that in your life? Why is God doing this? Why is God going there? What's going on here? What? Well, we're, we're missing it because we're trying to figure out what he's doing with us and what's, what's the deal with us. Does that make sense? We're going, okay, well, why are you doing this? Oh, I know there's something in me you're dealing with. Yeah, your ignorance. Uh, he's not just, in other words, what I'm saying is he, he's moving based on something eternal in his heart he redeemed you for something eternal in his heart that the redeemed have not yet come into. They have not yet entered into rest. Or we wouldn't have the book of Hebrews saying what it says. And again, we'll get into that, Lord willing, as we go. They didn't understand it, but I got news for you. David did see it. David got it. David's, David had a heart after God and it and it just moved him and he saw in the what we call the Old Testament scripture I got a feeling Dave, David felt like he was an Old Testament that he wasn't an Old Testament guy <laughs> I mean I think that the, the way he lived the way he loved the Lord the way he went after the things that were in the heart of God to, to bring those about um, turn with me to Psalms 26, and, and there are so many psalms that, you know, you can get this from David's heart, but this is just one example. Psalm 26. In verse uh, 8. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Listen to those words. David didn't just love the house of God. He loved the habitation of the house. He loved that God had a home. 
And it was a home that God liked. What if somebody said, well, I'm going to build you a home. And they went out and built it and you hated it. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, the plugs were all in the wrong places and da 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 da, you know, and it was, you know, or maybe you built a home according to what you like, you know. And then somebody, you know, they say, here, I'll give you this home. You go in and go, well, the kitchen's too small and the this is that and the da 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 da. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And you're just going, you know, uh, thanks, but no thanks. That's kind of what the Lord's dealing with. We're building it after the understanding of our own minds, and in fact, we're still, we've moved in with it. Uh, I, you know I could go further on all of that. <clears throat> but anyway, from these and many other verses, <clears throat> you see God can mold a hardened vessel like me and keep me from saying certain things. <laughs> You see from these and many other scriptures that David really, really, really did see this thing and he saw God's desire for rest and he moved on it. Now, to begin to, to see this full movement, we've got to go to, to Joshua. Let's go to the book of Joshua. Joshua, Judges, chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3 and verse 6. Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went over before the people. <clears throat> Do you remember? I mean, this is just an example of the fact that when the Ark of the Covenant moved, <clears throat> um, they had these staves that went through. They were like long bars that went through rings. <clears throat> and four priests would carry the, the Ark. It, all four would get up, put it on their shoulder, and they'd carry it forth. And that's what he's saying. Look, we're going into the land. <clears throat> Pick up this ark, and let's go in. Um, David saw that the purpose for God and the, for God having Israel journeying through the wilderness to the promised land wasn't about them. It was to carry this ark in. The ark was supposed to go in. The ark had a place, and therefore they had a place. And um, uh, instead of flipping over there and reading all this about the staves, I just want to say that I think that David even saw something about these staves that carried it in because this was the whole thing. The wilderness journey was all about those staves because that was the link between the ark and us. And that's where the two came together. And so these staves, uh, you can, if you write down scriptures, this is over in Exodus chapter 25, <clears throat> were, were long poles on which these priests would take up the, the, the uh, Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> and um, so let's look in verse, uh, let's look in verse 3 here since we're in Joshua. So let's read 3 and 4. <clears throat> And they commanded the people, saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites, bearing it. First, first of all, I'd like, to, I'd like to fasten something in your minds, not just for this sharing, but for all sharings. <clears throat> when you see the ark of the covenant and then the, verse, or the phrase after it, and the priests, the Levites. There's not even a comma in my Bible there. The priests, the Levites. The Levites were priests. The priests were Levites. It was the Levitical priesthood. That's important for a lot of things. But they're the ones bearing it. Then you shall remove from your place and go after it. All right, what did he say? They're getting ready to enter the land. Let's go take the land. Yeah, you know, can you imagine uh, uh, Braveheart riding on a horse up and down in front of him with his face all marked up? We're here. We made it to the edge of the land. We're going to fight for our God. We're going to take this land. Let's go. Ah! And they're all running madly into the land. Ah! Nothing like that happened. Not near as glorious. No, no. He said, when you see, when you see the ark, when you see the ark, and the guys carrying it, going in, follow it. Yes. Yes. 
Because this whole journey is about that ark leading them. He's, he's being, I'm going to put it like this, this ark is being driven. It is, it's like a magnet drawing toward, the, toward its place. And the people are supposed to follow it. So that's why he says what he says. And he says, when, when, when you see him move, you remove from your place and go after it. And then the next verse, verse 4, <clears throat> yet there shall be a space between you and it, about uh, <clears throat> 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And then verse 6 of what we read, And Joshua spoke unto the priest, saying, Take up the ark of the covenant and pass over before the people. And they, they picked up the ark, they passed over before the people. So, <clears throat> these staves were not just there for random trips. They were specifically made to bring the ark to this permanent resting place. They were our connection with it and therefore our understanding of what was in the heart, as it were, of the ark so that we might be his feet. Aren't we the body of Christ? Well, Jesus is, Jesus, we say Jesus is here. Well, where is he? I bet he's back behind them doors listening. Folks, he's here. He's in us. <clears throat> Amen? Amen? He's here. We're carrying him. We're the body of Christ. We're his hands and his feet. If he's going to do something, if, he, if he's going to reach to touch somebody, that's why it says lay hands on the sick because we're his hands. He still heals. Did you know that? He still does miracles, still does stuff, but guess what? <clears throat> he does it through his body. And so when you see this ark and the feet, the priest, the body bringing him forth, go after it. Go after it. Go after this picture, no, this reality that is pictured here. How many are priests? How many are the children of Israel? How many want to follow? How many want to follow him, not just go into the promised land? And, you know, you remember uh, in Oklahoma and many other states when they first uh, started the land grabs and, you know, people would come from the east and they'd come out uh, to Oklahoma and they'd all get in this big long line and all of them had their, their uh, horses and their mules and their uh, wagons and they'd shoot the gun and Everybody would run and go, oh, oh, I see a good piece of it. You know, I, I claim this, you know, and stick a thing in the ground. I get this one and I get this and I get that. <clears throat> None of it happened like that. It wasn't a land grab. It was following the ark. It wasn't go get what you can get from God. It was go see what you can get for God. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a change of pace for most Christians. We're like, you know, oh God, you know, of course we're looking up to heaven. Oh God! You know, have you ever wondered how a lot of them preachers really say that real, oh God! You know, it's because he's, he's so stinking far away, they have to yell. But he's, he's not that far away, he's right here in us. Oh Lord! Not me, but Christ in me. Hallelujah. And so, and you know, I mean, let's face it, we usually put the need, okay, let's forget us then, let's, lest we get offended and not want to listen to that man anymore. Let's talk about Israel, okay? Uh, where did Israel put the emphasis? Where did they put the need? It, it was the need, you know, what was the purpose of the journey? For Israel to get to the promised land. For us to get to the promised land. That was their understanding. This ark is pushing them in that direction. But folks, it wasn't to get them there. It was to get him there. For the Lord loves Zion. For the Lord chose Zion. For the Lord desires it for a habitation. And David saw it. David said, for the Lord. Hey, for the Lord. The Lord. The Lord. He didn't say, I want this. And God gave me everything I ever wanted. No, he said, Lord, remember the affliction I went through to get what you want, get you what you wanted. That's different. Oh, I don't want to go through any affliction. Okay, well, forget it. But those who will, 
those who will want what God wants. <clears throat> you know, I mean, it, David said, when the first scriptures we read, David said, you know, God wants a resting place, which is a home. He called it the house of God. It's a home. It's not just a building. It's a home. It's a, you know, that's where we rest, isn't it? In our homes. <laughs> So the staves would exist to this end. They exist for this end. I can prove it to you in the scriptures. We'll get into that. All right. Let's go to uh, 2 Samuel. Because we want to see David in relationship to the staves years later. <coughs> uh, 2 Samuel 6. Hope I got the right scripture. Yes. This is after David became king. And uh, we went over this story a little bit in one of the other sharings. But this is when he is <clears throat> king and he is um, bringing the ark back. Okay? In verse, uh, <clears throat> let's read 2 and 3. Second Samuel. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the ark of God whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts who dwelleth between the cherubim. <clears throat> and they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab <clears throat> excuse me which was in Gibeah and Uzzah and Ohio the sons of Abinadab drove the new cart. <clears throat> Anybody remember this story? Okay, David's all excited. They're dancing. They're doing all this stuff. <clears throat> but he's bringing the ark without the staves. The staves are the thing that exists that connect us with him to be his feet. It is the tie, it is the tie that binds. It is the thing that says we're his body, we're his priest, we're his bride, we're his... You understand? It is that the staves are there uh, helping us to bring about his permanent habitation. <clears throat> All right? So David, David knows God wants a habitation. But he puts the ark on a new cart, which is not the way God wanted it done because there's no real connection. It's just a reality. Folks, until this stuff is connected into our life, until we're connected with it, as long as it's just a teaching, as long as it's, you know, set up on a new card and everything, and, but we don't really have to <clears throat> bear, bear it. Because you have to bear some stuff. If you love God with all your heart, you're going to bear some stuff for Him. But David said, remember the affliction I went through for, for all my life to get this for you. But he only said that one verse when he began, and then he went off on the glory of what was. <laughs> but you, you do have to bear it. You can't just build a beautiful, you know, a beautiful. Um, I just, I was, I was going to say a beautiful cart, and then I saw a beautiful cathedral, and then I saw a beautiful setup where you don't really have to connect in. You can just go visit, hear a few sermons, give a little bit of money, go back. And, and hear a sermon that makes you feel really good while it has absolutely nothing to do with fulfilling God's heart. It's, well, come down to the altar and get stuff instead of come to the altar and die. Israel would never understand our modern-day altars. <laughs> you know, they'd just, they'd just blow their mind. they go, what? <clears throat> but that's, that's us. <clears throat> so... David ignored, as it were, these staves. He ignored them and, and uh, put this ark, uh, this, this, uh, the ark on a cart, and God rejected it. God rejected it because he has to be carried by men, not beasts. Some of you may remember Noah's story there, but... <clears throat> um, Folks, as New Testament priests, we are supposed to take him up and we're supposed to carry him to individuals and to, to congregations so that they become a habitation for God. That we are to take 
up this reality and go to individuals and, and establish a permanent dwelling place for his life. Go to congregations and declare unto them your purpose has not been fulfilled no matter how much you're doing if he's not the life living in this place. If this doesn't exist to house and make it a place for his glory by habitation. Glory by habitation. Not just glory. Give God glory. You know, give Him glory, all right, in the sanctuary of the living God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. All right. And just, you know, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, because most of you are familiar with this scripture, but it must be read. Ephesians 2. And let's see. Where am I? 19. Ephesians, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. Now therefore you are no more strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of this household of God, and are built upon the foundation of of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Now, this is an interesting wording here. This is an interesting wording, folks. This says in verse 19 that you are of the household of God. And what we, we get from that, we're of the household of God. And what we get from that is that we're in the family of God. But that's actually not the... Um, analogy that is used in here because he says you're of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the and Jesus Christ the chief cornerstone this is not an analogy that we're the family of God this is an analogy that we are the habitation of God Amen. you say well where do you get that from other than what you just said well other than what I just said I mean what I just said should be sufficient but thank God the apostle Paul knows where he's going with this <clears throat> Because Paul saw what David saw, what Moses saw, what every true man of God has seen. What is the, what is the desire of the Lord? <clears throat> and are built upon the foundation of the apostles, prophets, uh, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth to a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. There it is. I mean, it says it. We are the temple of God. We are not the temp. We are not a, the religious edifice of God. We are the house of God. We are the home of the Lord, where He lives. We are the ones who are inhabited. We are the house. We are the ones who are inhabited. So, the church is not just a religious gathering place. It is us. And as such, we are the habitation of God. It is Christ in you that is the hope of this whole thing. <laughs> Christ in you is the hope. Whose hope? Folks, Colossians 1.27 is his hope. It's his hope that we would become his habitation. <clears throat> All right. So, um, but just like David, modern day churches are having trouble. They're having problems with carrying the ark. <laughs> Do you get it? They're having problems carrying the ark. Most ministries are having tr you know, trouble carrying the ark. Why? Because there's many Christian ideas of what carrying him means. If you, if you, had no, if you didn't know that the, old, that the New Testament is the fulfillment of the old, and you wouldn't understand it unless you understood the old, He's, you're not just carrying him somewhere. Well, I'm carrying him to sinners. Folks, that's fine. But that was not the purpose of Israel. I am carrying him as an anointed minister of God. That's fine. But they were carrying him to a resting place, a place where a temple would be built, where he could stop traveling. Amen? All right, let's go to Numbers 14. If you're wondering why I seem to be rushing, 
It's because there are powers and forces around me. Numbers 14. And I trust that the Holy Spirit is imparting what it is he wants you to get. Numbers 14 and verse 44. Um, let's read. Uh, verse 40, 42. Go not up, for the Lord is not among you, that you be not smitten before your enemies, for the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. Verse 44, but they presumed to go up into the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. All right. Folks, the whole journey was following the ark because that ark was pressing forward to his habitation, his resting place. So now they get to the edge of the land. They go in the land. They spy out the land. They say, it's a good land. But they come back and they go, oh, my God, there's giants. There's, there's Amalekites and there's, there's scary things. If we're going to follow the Lord into his habitation, it's going to be bad. There's going to be stuff that's going to happen. There's going to be affliction and all this kind of stuff. And we don't want to go in. And we're, we're scared. And so we're not going to go in. Anybody familiar with, with the whole story? This is the end of that. And so Moses is saying, look. And so, so Moses says, okay, that's it. We're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. What is their response? Oh, no, no, no. We'll go up. We'll go up. We're, we're ready. We're ready. No, your heart's not in it. You just, you're just doing it now because you don't want to wander for 40 years. You're not doing it because you found my desire and are following my ark. No, no. We will follow you. We're going up. He says, don't go up. I'm telling you, God is not among you. So they go up. And it says right here, they went up. And only two people didn't go up. Moses and the ark. The ark. I thought they were following the ark. We'll go up. We'll do what you want. We'll follow you, Lord. The only way you could follow the Lord in the Old Testament in, in the wilderness was to follow that ark. Now he's not, he's not pressing in at this moment, but they're going to go in and they're going to fight for God and they're going to do all this stuff. and <clears throat> You know. But they missed the point. They missed the point. They didn't follow the ark. They went for the ark. <clears throat> and, you know, the ark of the covenant was the most important object in Israel's possession. And yet, from this point on that we just read, it is not mentioned for 40 years. From this point. You know, the ark, the main object, the one that they were all following, it's not mentioned for 40 years after this point. Why? Because at this point, Israel would not enter into the land, and so they began to wander in the wilderness. The definition of wandering in the wilderness is going anywhere that is not leading toward what is the purpose of the ark. Which is what? A habitation. The de My God, have we gotten a lot of definitions of wandering in the wilderness. But folks, God's definition is the definition. He's not going to even mention the ark anymore. Why? Because they're, they're totally, they've totally missed it. They have totally missed it. And so, at Kadesh Barnea, that's when they turned back. And they went into the wilderness for 40 years because they would not seek out a resting place for him. Okay? Now, this is, uh, how much time do I have? 10 minutes. Just enough time to not even start on this next phase here. <clears throat> but let's turn to Hebrews and let's go ahead and attempt it uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and say something here. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. <clears throat> um, uh, this is going to be a real important section, so I, you know, I need you to see this in the Scriptures because it's just undeniable. Um, 
I am uh, not going to be able to finish this right now. So I'm going to share tonight. And I'm going to finish this, this part that I've done. So um, just so you'll know what's, what will be going on tonight. <clears throat> um, Hebrews 3. I want you to notice um, verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Spirit saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of the trial of the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Drop down to verse 18. And we, we should read this whole thing, but, I, you know, time I get through, it'll be time to stop. And to whom swore he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. Okay, now let's go over to chapter 4. Chapter 4 and verse 7. Again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, today after so long a time, as it is said, today if you will hear his voice and harden not your hearts. Okay, okay just... Just notice that, that it was brought out by Moses and them. Today, if you will not harden your hearts, and then after a long, long time, David is saying the same thing. That's what we read in verse 7. Now, now drop down to verse 10, and we'll just finish with 10 and 11. For he that entered into his rest, he hath also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Folks, all of Hebrews 3 and 4 is talking about entering into rest, but it is talking about specifically entering into his rest, not our rest. Okay? So the subject is entering into his rest, Go into the land. Stop doing stuff that's provoking the Lord. <laughs> Which specifically is, in this case, in these scriptures, not going in and establishing a place of His rest. So, um, now, just to, I'm not sure how far I'll be able to get with all this, but I want you to notice, look back in chapter uh, three again. Remember we started the verse seven. Wherefore is the Holy Spirit said today if you will hear his voice. Okay. That's pretty powerful. He's saying today. Is he not? Is he not? And does he not mean by these literally today, every day, any day, every day, wherever you're at, somebody for God's sake. <laughs> I mean, because he's saying in, even David after so long a time is still saying today. And then the Hebrew writer is saying to Christians after Christianity had been for a while, I'm saying it too. Today, <clears throat> if you will, you know, hear his voice. Okay? Where did this come from? Where did this conversation in the book of Hebrews come from? Where did it, what spawned it? Do you believe usually when you just go off into, you know, you're talking about this and this and this, and then all of a sudden you just go off. Have you ever felt like the Bible just jumps into other subjects all of a sudden without warning? You just go, how did we get here? Well, that's kind of the way I used to look at this, but I found out where it came from. Let's look in the same chapter. Let's just look at the two verses before it. Verse 4, starting verse 4. And every house is built by some man, but he that built all things is God. Alright, let's first of all focus in on the fact that he's talking about a house. Hebrews 3, 4. He's talking about a house being built. That's the subject. Before he gets into this whole wilderness thing. Am I right or wrong? <clears throat> okay, next verse. But Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony to those things which were to be spoken after, which is dealing with oneness and habitation and all that. Moses was just getting them to the point where it could be a permanent place, getting them to the land. He's just a servant to the house. But finally, the verse just before all of this stuff about the wilderness where we started, 
Verse 6, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house we are. What is the subject of verse 6 before it starts into this whole foray into the wilderness? It's saying that Christ is the son. He's the one who lives in the house. We, it is his own house and we are that house. Could it get any more plain? I mean, can it get any more plain? If, if we hold the, you know, hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. What rejoice? You know, what? What? Being his house, being his habitation. <laughs> if we'll hold that all the way through, if we'll, if we'll, if we'll be like David who wanted to build God a house, who wanted God to have a habitation, who saw, and David even expressed it in those first scriptures that we read, I saw in the heart of God his desire for a habitation and I set my course and my whole life I began to live. Folks, we're not talking about history here. We're talking about the same thing. Hebrews is talking about the same. Today, there are people who won't enter into the land because they're not after his desire and they're not following the ark that is pressing in to get in there and have his habitation. They're literally just, now they're just wandering because the ark hasn't been mentioned and we, we'll get into it here in just, just shortly. But it hasn't even been mentioned for 40 years because they have no direction. They think they do. You better believe that they're going, oh, you know, this is good. You know, I just, you know, finding different, you know, there's only so many things you can do in a wilderness for 40 years. You know, praise God for that cactus. You know, I mean, there's only so much that you can, you can get into. And so, um, Hebrews is literally saying, Jesus is a son over his own house and we're the house. Wherefore, the Holy Spirit is saying, today, if you'll hear this voice, that's the next verse. Is anybody able to follow this? It's, um, it's really just like step from this verse to this verse and then follow it through. And it's all about him having his house, having his, his rest, us being not not just a, a, a religion, but being the house of God, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ living his life through you instead of you fumbling and bumbling and trying to do it right. We have hope. We, if we hold this confidence, steadfast to the end. And so... Um, Let's go ahead and go to Psalm 95. And the Psalms, by the way, are full of this. I'm barely giving you 95. <clears throat> Starting with verse 7. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tried me and tested me and saw my work. Does this sound familiar? This is a quotation in Hebrews. Where did they get this from? They're quoting David, the man whose heart was after God, to build him a habitation. Verse 10, um, Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, and they, do, they have not known my ways. Unto whom I swore in my wrath, they, shall, they should not enter into my rest. Okay, we're going we're gonna to clarify that rest more and more as we go, but folks, that rest is his rest where the ark finally gets, and, and the only way to truly deal with this is to see the end result in Solomon's temple. It's the only way to truly get this. But so here, David is quoting this. David is talking after so long a time. 
He's seeing the same thing that Moses saw. He's seeing that, uh, what was it? I just saw something. Just for, Oh, that, that, he's, that he's saying in verse um, 7, For he is our God, and we're the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Okay. That is in the same verse that says, Today, if you will hear his voice and harden not your heart. What, what, what? Do you comprehend what it just said? It's saying, we, for, we, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice and harden not in your heart. Do you get it? Or do I need to be like Walter Cronkite and explain it? <clears throat> it is saying, he's leading them through the wilderness like a bunch of sheep. We quote this all the time. We go, we are the sheep and the people. He's saying, I don't want you to be my sheep anymore. I don't want you to just be following the ark. I want you to become a habitation of God, not just led around by people that preach and you follow them, but Christ formed in you. Hallelujah. And so, so I mean, that's why he's saying it. He's saying, for we are, he is our God. Yes, he's our God, but he's not our owner. He's not, he hadn't cleared out the hidden made a scourge and driven all the junk out of his house because he's got a zeal for that house. This is my house. Get out. Hallelujah. That's what it's saying. He's saying because you keep holding to just being a flock of sheep that's following. You know, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I'll lead you forever. No, sir. He didn't say that. He said, I'm the good shepherd. I'll give my life for the sheep. Well, when he dies on the cross, we die. I mean, that's just a fact. That's just a scriptural reality that we follow him to the cross. Hallelujah. And then when Christ begins to come up in resurrection, we are his body. We are his house. And he's the owner. And in this place right here, they're just following him. And with the very, and I'm just going to say, I'm getting real close to having to quit here. But the very scripture that we're going, we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. The very one we're quoting and going, oh, praise God, and feeling all mushy and fuzzy. He's saying, you got hardened sheep hearts. <laughs> because, because why? Because your concepts won't change. You're still just following God instead of being a habitation of God. Because you're still just being sheep led around instead of being where I live. You, you want to crawl up into his lap and be a fuzzy little sheep. Have you ever seen the picture of Jesus holding a little sheep? And the, my God, the sheep is smiling and got, got long eyelashes and looking into Jesus' face and everybody that sees it goes, oh, I'm just a sheep. I'm one of his sheep. Oh, praise God. Well, if the real Jesus was holding that, he would say, why do you harden your heart? Am I right or wrong? Is that not what the scriptures are saying? And so, uh, he saw things, David saw things in terms of God's rest. That's how he saw it. He saw things in terms of God's habitation, not ours. Was it in, were there certain things included in that rest that would bless us? Yes, my God, could it get any higher that we would be the body of Christ, that we would be the bride of Christ. But folks, we're not Christ. And we are owned and possessed by him. And I'll get into that all a whole nother time and whatever. So let me try to finish this, this little bit up here. Um, Israel, you know what? I probably need to stop right here if I'm going to share tonight. So I'm going to leave you with this. Uh, and this is where we'll pick up tonight. Israel got to the edge of the land and they turned back. And why they turned back 
was excruciating to the Lord. Because he thought they were, yes, at that point, his sheep following the ark until they came into the promise and became the habitation. And when they got to the edge of the land, it was more about them than it was about him. Okay. So that's, we need to pick up that point because that point is going to take us into the next appearance of the ark 40 years later. <laughs> Amen? The next, don't you want to see the ark appear again? Amen. And don't you want to get after it and go into what he's got? Yes. So, you know, I leave you hanging, literally hang, <laughs> hanging on a cross. I leave you hanging there. But there is the promise that we will enter into as we finish out these scriptures tonight. All right, let's, let's pray. Why don't you stand with me? Hallelujah. Father, we just uh, so long, not, not to, to gain the truth of this, but to see your heart. Which, which will help us gain the truth of it. But Lord, not, not just to taught by some preacher that says, even if it bears witness with our spirit, Lord, we want to be taught of you. And I want them to be taught of you. And I have no desire, Father, that we camp around a truth. I have every desire that each and every one of us would see into your heart and be moved the way David was and be brought to utter weakness in ourselves because we see that our, our desire and our purposes hasn't been as firm as they should have been. But Lord, you're faithful and you love us and you stay with us and you eventually brought Israel in. And so Father, we ask the Holy Spirit to be released. Lord, when we're away from here, when we're gathered tonight, that you may communicate, Holy Spirit, that you may communicate not to hardened hearts, but that today, today we'll hear your voice. And it'll be the beginning of light because you said the entrance of thy word giveth light. And it will begin to open new vistas for us and the seeds that will be planted today and tonight will bring forth glorious fruit unto you and honor to your name, Jesus. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.